Sean Connery was picked as the actor most likely to succeed in convincing the audience that he was James Bond, Secret Service Agent Extraordinary in the service of Her Majesty the Queen of England. In the words of Ian Fleming, James Bond is about six feet tall and somewhere in his middle thirties. He has dark, rather cruel good looks and very clear blue-gray eyes. What else must Mr. Connery be? He must be at home with small firearms of all kinds, such as this 25 caliber Beretta, Bond's favorite weapon. A small gun that is only accurate at fairly close range. And Bond always seems to be at close range with his enemy. At any rate, the producers were satisfied that Mr. Connery seemed to find the little gun as comfortable a handle as did the original Mr. Bond. In addition to the Beretta, Connery had to gain a familiarity with such friendly little weapons as the Walther PPK, or, for big jobs, the Smith & Wesson Long Barrel 38, known as the Man Stopper. As any Bond fan knows, opinions differ very often at the choice of arms, and occasionally a conference will be called to discuss what weapon is to be used and on whom. Take off your jacket. Give me a gun. Yes, I thought so. This Beretta again. I told you about this before. You tell him. For the last time. Nice and light. In a lady's handbag. No stopping power. Any comments, 007? I disagree, sir. I'd used the Beretta for ten years. I've never missed with a jet. Yeah, maybe not. But it jammed on your last job and you spent six months in hospital in consequence. If you carry a double-O number, it means you're licensed to kill, not get killed. And another thing, since I've been head of MI6, there's been a 40% drop in double-O operative casualties, and I wanted to stay that way. You'll carry the water. Unless, of course, you prefer to go back to standard intelligence duties. No, sir. I would not. Then from now on, you carry a different gun. Show him, Armour. Walter PPK, 7.65 mil with a delivery like a brick through a plate glass window. Takes a brush silencer with very little reduction in muzzle velocity. The American CIA swear by them. Thank you, Major Blue. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Any questions, 007? No, sir. All right, then. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Double O seven. Sir? Just leave the Beretta. And who is this man who tells James Bond, alias Sean Connery, that he may not use his favorite weapon? He is, of course, Bond's employer, known only as M. And here, too, the producers were faced with the problem of finding a man who would most closely fit Fleming's description of M. The weather-beaten face that Bond knows so well, that holds so much of his loyalty, the quiet gray eyes, the little pulse that always beats high up on the right temple whenever M is tense. As a cover, cloak and dagger word for disguise, M is managing director of Universal Exports Company. The offices of this company are coincidentally on the eighth floor of a building in Regent's Park, the home of the British Secret Service. Sean Connery will have to convince many people that he is a simple, peace-loving man, James Bond, dealing in import-export. But his employee's number is 007. And this 00 prefix is his license to kill. And sometimes silence, especially when it's built into a gun, is the better part of being a hero. Of course, Mr. Connery, as James Bond, does meet a few people he doesn't kill, although he may come very close for both. And how provoking can one be? James Bond, as all Bond fans know, often finds himself in some of the biggest gambling casinos, coolly and nonchalantly playing for fantastically high stakes. 
So the producers were faced with yet another problem in selecting a man to portray 007. How will we look at the gambling tables? Never knowing whether the others are enemies or friends. And here too, Connery seemed to fit Fleming's conception of the character perfectly. But friends must not keep Mr. Connery from his work. James Bond's loyal fans won't like that. Womanizing is one thing. Bond fans want action. No one will object, however, to an occasional moment of relaxation with one of Bond's favorite drinks, made with impeccable style, vodka, and a twist of lemon. It's totally in keeping with Bond's flair for being a connoisseur of all fine things. Unfortunately for Mr. Connery, Bond is not always so selective in his choice of hosts, and his host's friends might not be his. In order to get away from it all, Bond would drive in one of several cars. His fans like variety. So another question was, could Mr. Connery handle a 1930 Bentley convertible with an Amherst Villiers supercharger? And could he make a racing change from third to second in an Aston Martin DB3? And how well could he drift this otherwise dignified 3.4 sedan around the fast bend? Well, as any Bond fan can see, Mr. Connery does very well. This time in a 1.6 liter Roadster. Driving this car, James Bond has two reasons for wanting to make fast time. One is that armored hearse chasing. And when you're being chased by an armored hearse, the other reason doesn't matter. Other than danger and excitement, James Bond must seem erudite, knowledgeable about such things as seashells, etc. But one thing Mr. Connery can look forward to, the expected ending to any James Bond adventure, the warmth and comfort of friendly surroundings, a well-deserved rest. We have seen a few of the problems Sean Connery faces in bringing to light the many-sided character of James Bond, secret service agent in the best cloak and dagger tradition. Here, on the set of Dr. No, Connery discusses with Ian Fleming some of the finer points of secret servicing, a topping Fleming is well equipped to discuss. Many of James Bond's experiences have some basis in fact, facts that Fleming came across while serving as assistant to Britain's Director of Naval Intelligence during World War II, and which he has used to embroider the exciting adventures of secret agent 007, James Bond. 